Welcome. Throughout this program, we will be sharing the remarkable works of Brother Thomas on your screens. Next, stay until the conclusion and you will be submitted into a drawing to win either the Book of Creation out of clay or four separate day books that feature Brother Thomas's work with quotations from his writings. Four winners will be selected at random and we will reach out to them after this event. So good luck um, and on to Mr. Pucker. Welcome, welcome. What a great joy to be part of this, the first presentation of Art and Spirituality, which was created to honor three amazing people, Sister Maureen Tobin, Brother Thomas Bazanson, and Sister Joan Chichester. We hope to acknowledge this perfect trio of magnificent spirits that has continued to expand and enrich our lives and enrich the world. What a great privilege, a rare gift and blessing it has been to know and walk alongside these Gedolim Hador, the Hebrew for the major spiritual persons of an age. Sue and I can only say great thanks for the opportunity to have known all of them. Their gifts continue to be ever present in our lives. We have wanted for some time to find a way to thank the entire Mount St. Benedict community for the gift of their friendship and for including Brother Thomas as a beloved and meaningful member of their community. The remarkable art that he created while at Mount St. Benedict has been launched into the world, has generated great blessings and produces great joy for others. The mountain gave him an embrace of love and hospitality that filled his soul and his art. Thank you. We wanted to honor the trio by supporting these presentations on art and spirituality over the next five years. In doing so, their dream of art as a spiritual force can be appreciated and pursued. I often use quotes from Brother Thomas in my writings and talks because I believe that he said it so well, I should simply use his words and credit him. Today, I turn to another great source of wisdom, Abraham Joshua Heschel, who Thomas met once at the Weston Priory. In 1962, in Heschel's collection of essays entitled The Insecurity of Freedom, he wrote, character education can only be carried out in depth as cultivation of total sensitivity. There is no compassion without a sense of wonder and reverence for the mystery of being. Character education must begin by involving man's innate sense of wonder and continue to cultivate man's capacity for radical amazement by raising issues which the individual is called upon to answer inwardly and personally. To educate means to cultivate the soul, not only the mind. What better way to introduce Sister Joan, a most dear friend, an amazing force for good and for soul-filled beauty to guide us into the discussion of art and spirituality. Joan? Ah, oh, Bernie, you've done it again. Uh, I'm supposed to talk after that. <laughs> um, back to the matter, Bernie and Sue. Thanks to Thomas, the bridge um, has has touched us deeply as a community. Uh, that that relationship did not end with Thomas's going, and we've I have learned more from them and Pucker Gallery than they will ever know. At this point, then. I, I, uh, I'm sorry, I, I've, uh, I've pressed the wrong. There we go. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk today about beauty, art, and spirituality, a study in soul, in spirit, in bread, and in lilies. This exploration of the relationship 
between beauty, the arts, and spirituality will come to you filtered through three classic commentaries on the place of beauty in life. The first is from the philosopher Francis Bacon, who writes, beauty itself is but the sensible image of the infinite. Let's try that again. Beauty itself is but the sensible image of the infinite. Or to translate that a little differently, isn't he saying beauty is the image of God within our or even beauty is the presence of God to our senses. Whatever the subtle implications here, beauty clearly has something to do with the presence of God in our lives. The second insight into the nature of beauty then comes from the well of ancient monasticism and calls us to focus on the important things in life, even at life's most difficult moments. The desert monastics tell us that one night bandits came to the hermitage of an old monastic and said, whatever you think, we have come to take everything in your cell. And the old monastics said, well, then take it all, my sons. So the bandits gathered up everything they found and went away, but they left behind a little bag with silver candlesticks. When the monastic saw it, she picked it up and ran after them shouting, take these, take these. You forgot them and they are the most beautiful of all. The third insight then comes from an ancient Chinese proverb that teaches, when you have only two pennies, spend one on bread and the other on a lily. The first commentary, of course, is highly philosophical. The second is deeply spiritual. And the third, in a capitalist culture, is considered totally insane. So the real question of the moment is, where, my friend, are you today? Which of those three insights is you and why? Each of those insights you see sear the soul with eternal questions as well. The first important question, is, for what purpose does the world collect beauty, enshrine it, and preserve it? And the second question asks, for what use is the uselessness of this collecting process in the quest for a productive life? The implications of those two questions for human development, for spiritual growth, for social progress, wet all the coals of the heart, which too often now, in this day, in this place, only smolder coldly in the dry bed of the heart. Today, then, we'll look at beauty from several dimensions. One, we'll consider what the philosophers say about it. Two, we'll consider the relationship between beauty and contemplation. Three, we'll examine the place of beauty in public life. And four, we'll connect beauty to the spiritual life from which it springs and has its being. Beauty, philosophy argues quite clearly, has a very clear role in life, unlike anything else in creation. It has, in fact, a life-giving reason for its existence, or the Philosophers will tell you, beauty is a beacon in the mountain of the mind that shows us the way to our best selves. Or put it another way, beauty is that moment of insight in which the genie of a thing is caught in a single flash and a heartbeat of awareness that affects my entire life. Not all pieces, but some pieces own me. Beauty, in other words, calls us to a sense of an everlasting now. It stirs in us what can never, once experienced, be dismissed. It lives on in us because it has already opened the door of our hearts, whether we are conscious of it or not, to something new, something that struck us, 
and will not now go away. Beauty, in other words, lifts life above the anesthetizing effects of dullness and rote that comes with the pedestrian, the prosaic, that smothers us from all sides, and lo, gives us a reason for going on that surpasses just breathing. It gives us a reason for being at all. Beauty enables us to pause long enough in life to remember that some things are worth striving for, that some things are worth doing over and over again until they become their breathless selves in us. Like maybe, like the ephemeral sound of the oboe, something beyond our grasp, yes, yet so embedded in the heart and mind of us. Something like the statue of Moses in chains in a tiny temple on a back street in Rome. Once seen, it is never able to be unseen. Beauty brings with it a realization in the midst of struggle, in the depths of darkness, in the throes of ugliness, that the best in life is really possible. And yet, what may be most missing in this highly technological and pragmatic world of ours is beauty. We want functionalism in this society, not art. And so this culture simply basks in kitsch, in the sleazy and the chintzy and the crude, in the tawdry and the sentimental, in the gross and the overblown, in taking a Rembrandt and making a cartoon out of it. Beauty, right proportion in all things, Aristotle called it, gives us in a flash the essence of a thing, the creative truth of the thing as just right, not more, not less. It simply ignites our buried feelings in a flood of fierce awareness. It changes the way we think, Real art is truth. It is a presence in which we suddenly see without seeing. We somehow come to know the truth of a thing without having to know it at all. We see Rembrandt's flight into Egypt and we know the taste of desolation now. How can that be? Because it brings the something that comes awake in the soul in the presence of profound beauty. Who did not weep at the thought of the fire in Notre Dame? Aristotle warns us that beauty is the awareness, the recognition, the consciousness of harmony, of rightness in a universe in chaos which must be developed in us for our own sake, or we ourselves shall be the poor, the more limited soulfully without it. It is this pursuit of rightness, right order, right balance, right use, as in that color is just right. That shape is just right for this room. And that statue is just right for that memorial. Instead, in this world of ours, we smear cheap paint over good wood, and that is not just right. We prefer plastic flowers, pretend flowers, to wild flowers. We're willing to reproduce the marble pieta in plastic. We forego the natural and the real for the gaudy and the pretentious. We are, as a people, awash in the banal, the stock and the stereotype, the mundane and the vapor. We have lost a sense of beauty, of just rightness, of the power of insight into another's awareness. And this loss of dialogue with beauty may be the clearest sign we have that we have lost our way to God. 
Without a commitment to beauty, we miss, as Francis Bacon said, the glory of the face of God in the here and now. Beauty lures us beyond the superficialities of life to the depths of it. And the soul that immerses itself in beauty thrives on its truth, which is now planted deep down in us. It is then beauty that magnetizes the contemplative. And so it is the duty of the contemplative to make beauty a way of life. To give that sense of truth to others like little silver candlesticks so that the rest of the world may in the midst of this squalor, that ugliness, so much pain. Remember that beauty is still possible because somewhere we have seen it with our own eyes. Because beauty feeds contemplation and at the same time, beauty is its end. A sense of beauty evokes in us consciousness of the eternal in the temporal. Just as Francis Bacon said, beauty is but the sensible image of the infinite. Beauty, in other words, lifts our eyes beyond the commonplace and in the midst of struggle, in the depths of darkness, in the throes of ugliness. It's beauty that takes us beyond the visible to the height of consciousness, past the ordinary to the mystical, away from the extreme to the endlessly true, because it has been said in a language and a tongue we have never seen or heard before, this moment, this sight, this sound, this breakthrough moment of our own consciousness to the moreness of life. And therefore, in ourselves, we can understand it totally. It's beauty, you see, that sustains the human heart when all of its formulas and functions, equations and predictions fail. Whatever the dullness of a world stupefied by the mediocre, in the end, beauty is able by penetrating our own souls to penetrate the ugliness of the world around us, awash in the cheap, the imitative, the excessive, the overdone, and the cruel. Beauty is not a matter of having enough money to buy anything in sight. In fact, that may be part of our problem. Beauty is a matter of having enough soul to recognize quality, truth, and harmony when we see it. Beauty is truth. And truth, beauty. That's all we know and all we need to know the poet John Keats wrote. But why is that true? And how do we know it's true? Because beauty is the experience of truth, of knowing what you're seeing and what it means that is in the very soul of our own life. But beauty, we also know now, scientifically, we know now that beauty is also a basic human instinct. It's also the kind of thing that separates us from the animals. It's an intrinsic quality of the human soul, the scientists now tell us, the irrepressible expression of contemplative insight. It has something to do not only with what it means to be alive, but with what it means to see behind the mask of the obvious to its meaning to us and to me to its revelation of new truth to me, to its evaluation of the life I'm living now. Beauty is a call to the heart to grow on. Just keep growing on. Grow on in truth of my own life, of this piece of life everywhere which is why beauty always somehow manages to penetrate the streets as well as the galleries 
Humans we come to see are simply made for beauty. The human soul seeks them out. The mind wrestles with its meaning and artists create it in the midst of indigence, impoverishment, wretchedness. Artists create murals in ghettos. They do hand-woven rugs on reservations. They write poetry in shanty towns. They do tree sculptures in the barrios. Why? To show us the truth of them, to enable us to see the glory even of the dirt that floods us perhaps, to show us truth in the concentration camps, or simply to allow us to remember a better way than the way we're living now to continue to hope for it because we have seen it, to refuse to die inside because of it. The human community everywhere makes beauty its bulwark against despair. Otherwise, how account for those who come out of prisons, came out of concentration camps, came out of great pressure and fear? Well, holy kind, accepting, positive, and sure, sure that life will be better. You and I have seen those things even in small ways in our own lives as one person after another fought back death and became even more in life because of it. The only question is whether or not we have realized how spiritual, how impacting the effect of that. So we've looked at the philosophical understanding of beauty, just rightness, just rightness. Its link to the full life is an even fuller understanding of life. To see in an artist's work something we never even saw about our own lives is a great philosophical moment and an even greater personal one. And we have also considered then the relationship of the contemplative to the effect of beauty on the quality of life and the obligation of the contemplative to maintain it. But beauty is also very alive on streets long forgotten by the rest of the world. It is a world crying out to be heard, to be seen, to be understood in street corner chalk drawings, in the graffiti on slum walls, in its major portraits on empty buildings. For instance, for some particularly hard years, our community held a public giveaway. It was stationed in the parking lot of the community soup kitchen that is located in the heart of the inner city. The items available for sale came from the sisters themselves. As part of the community's Lenten preparation, each of us gave up something so someone else could have access to what, to beyond what food stamps or welfare checks could provide them. The things that appeared in the Lenten boxes were good things. They were in good condition. They were new or barely used or completely refurbished. Whatever their condition, however, they were basically very practical things. A new sweater, an old pen set, a jacket someone had outgrown, a scarf that was still in its gift box, and a few isolated things on the side that defied categorization, like a harmonica, maybe, or a pair of dumbbells from the monastery, and a cut glass vase. On the day appointed, every guest at the soup kitchen got a coupon book of six tickets to spend at the tables in the parking lot outside. That year, the tables were heaped, two tables full of women's blouses, of course, one table full of shoes, one table full of coats, a small table full of odds and ends like pins and wallets and small tools, and over against the fence at the far end of the parking lot, stack after stack of pictures 
framed pictures, framed. Pictures of everything, the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls, tulips from some place we'd never been, sunsets, country scenes, the lake, of course, whatever. Pictures, hundreds of pictures taken right off the bedroom walls of the monastery. Good heavens, I thought, and I must confess, I'm, I'm a bit testily, who donated those? Nobody's going to want that kind of stuff. But when I looked up from the coat table, 20 minutes later, most of the coats were still there, but all the pictures were gone. Not one picture was left leaning against the fence. Up and down the street in the inner city, as far as the eye could see, there were old women in sneakers, young women with children, and men in jeans carrying away pictures the size of a fireplace lintel. All great art? Absolutely not, not one of them. But all of them real art, fresh, genuine, not copies of anything, just real impressions of life shared by some unknown artist, probably. Why, I wondered, with no small amount of chagrin, why would they want pictures when we had shoes and coats for them? I was young, clearly. And then I knew it's called soul. And you often miss it in sneakers and jeans, and you can't satisfy it on food stamps. Soul is that extra something that we bring ourselves to make life beautiful. It's what gives us the capacity to appreciate it, no matter how poor or how limited we ourselves are. When you see something in a situation that no one else has seen, that's soul. Soul is the way we show we're still alive and thinking and wondering and loving, not living, alive. The problem is that soul is what we are required to create in ourselves. It doesn't come packaged. All we get in life is the raw material to make a soul for ourselves, as these soup kitchen shoppers were doing, as they lugged home the kind of beauty their bare rooms and empty walls did not have till then. It was a Lenten gift so yearned for, we could not have imagined it ourselves. But as long as beauty exists in us, the healers of the soul say, then life is worth living. On the other hand, when beauty gives way to pencil and glitz, to the demeaning of great art and cheap plastic replicas, to the dehumanization and vulgarity of relationships that do not satisfy with love, then beware the chaos in the human spirit that winds up in jail, in depression, in pain. Psychologists tell us about the effects of deprivation on the soul of a people starved beauty of new life and lively new insights. It gives us even because of a thing like COVID that cuts people off. Then we discover the power of beauty to refresh and rekindle us in the dark spots of life. But really, you ask, is that true? Is beauty really a catalyst of life? And how do we know that? Those were my questions too. And the answer came to me in two very unlikely places. The first from Mexico and the second in Cité Soleil in Haiti. In the Gold Museum in Mexico City years and years ago of all places, I got my first real glimpse into the truth of what I'd read in philosophy books. There, displayed with all the finesse of shuttered jewelry stores on Fifth Avenue in New York 
were dangling gold earrings and gleaming gold bracelets, shining gold pendants and bright amber stones to confirm eternity, all set in gold ring made thousands of years ago. And all of this from one of the oldest cultures on earth, a culture known for human sacrifice and high learning, a warrior society of great architecture. And then it's breathtaking beauty, the sign of souls in search for the sublime. I remember stopping in front of those display cases simply to try myself to put all those aspects of life from a primitive society into some framework I myself could understand. And then it came to me. A society that could make such beauty was capable of endless human potential. In fact, the inferior savage myth had to be born out of our own warped imaginations. Beauty was clearly a genuine, universal, global human desire. Beauty was the bedrock of the human soul. But most impacting of all, the second time that beauty shocked me into a new sense of what it means to be human in an inhuman environment happened in the slum of all slums in Haiti. Here, people live in one room hovels made of corrugated tin and sleep on mud floors. They bear and raise one child after another here, most of them stark, thin, and sharp boned or with big, swollen, starving stomachs. They eat the leftovers of society. They scrounge for wood just to warm the inedible. They sleep in filth and live in rags and barely smile and cannot read. But in the middle of human degradation, they paint bright colors and brilliant scenes of a laughing, loving, wholesome community. They carve the faces around them. They paint strident colors on bowls made out of coconuts that they will sell you for pennies. And at night, they play singing drums across the bare mountains that echo the cries of their very human hearts. They manufacture beauty in defiance of what it means to live an ugly, forgotten life on the fringe of the wealthiest nation the world has ever known. But in all their anguish and destitution, they are to the rest of us a sign of possibility and aspiration, wanting something beautiful in life and humanity at its best, which no amount of huts or guns or poverty or starvation can ever squelch in the human soul. And if you come into our priory, I will show you a solid piece of wood, old wood with nine faces carved into it, which years ago I put in our chapel as our holy pictures and holy statues of a larger chapel. Beauty, art, and spirituality all stretch the spirit above the mundane of the human spirit and drive the human race beyond itself and above itself, despite the inhumanity that tugs daily at our heels, even as we're trying to move beyond. Mexico City, Haiti, the Outlanders. Ah, but then there was another moment too, an ordinary one, one to be taken for granted, except it was another time and place. 
I was late years past the primitive and away from the stench of fecal matter and the sight of living skeletons. I was far away from the undernourishment that comes with the debasement of people. Instead, I was in France for a meeting, a meeting that was far too convoluted and way too long. Worse, there was only one afternoon left free on the schedule, one. That question was obvious. What one thing could anyone do in Paris that would tap the essence of the society, touch the heart of the culture, walk into the soul of the city in Paris? In Paris, the answer had to be art. I had never been in the Louvre, one of Europe's oldest and most prestigious art galleries. It sits in the very center of the city and holds one of the largest collections of great art in the entire world. It is, in other words, an eye into the best that time has had to offer us. It is room after room after room of wall-sized paintings larger than life sculptures, period furniture, and collections of the masters in wide open galleries. And tucked into an alcove on the landing of a back stairway, defended only by a small blue velvet rope, stood a Rembrandt on a very low easel. A Rembrandt sitting there, unguarded, uncovered, unchained, and close enough to touch, low enough to pick up and simply carry away. Where are the guards? I asked our guide. Isn't this dangerous? I mean, you, you know, to have a painting like this, simply sitting here open in a back stairway? I, well, I could just pick that up and carry it out. And the guide smiled. Oh, but not at all, madame, she said. If you would take that painting under your arm, every scullery maid in France would chase you. Art is our national inheritance. We would all guard it with our lives. I tried to imagine what it is in the United States that is our national inheritance. I thought of bombs and rockets. I thought of cars and computers and I winced. I wondered if we would defend beauty at all. And then I remembered something else, something historical, something real in my own life. In the 11th to 15th century, a movement sprang up in Europe in the midst of all the decay and disorder that their petty internal wars had been plying for years in life. In those centuries, however, the church started granting indulgences for artists who worked on the building of cathedrals, as well as for those who took part in the Crusades. Uh, one, the Crusaders were taking a culture down, they told us, for the glory of God. And the other, the artists, were building a culture up. And that too, they told us, was for the glory of God. And lo, a whole new era of the arts took over from one end of Europe to the other. Architecture, sculpting, glasswork, masonry, painting, poetry, music, writing, printing, illumination. And most of all, most of all, it was the monasteries, Benedictine monasteries in large part, were stable communities that found and fostered creativity as an aspect of the spiritual life. Beauty, the discovery of the invisible in the visible. Beauty, 
the discovery of the invisible in the visible became a certified dimension of a path to the God whose presence shone in creation, as Francis Bacon said, for all to see. Our rule, the rule of Benedict, in fact, in the sixth century, devotes an entire chapter to the artists of the monastery. The relationship between beauty and the spiritual life was now a universal one because monasticism is an established way of life that concentrates on the search for God. Art, our world, now treats as an expression of personal insight and truth, yes, for those who see it, yes, and yet monasteries everywhere, quietly, unostentatiously, are centers and veritable nuclei of beauty. The grounds, the buildings themselves, the chapels, the hallway galleries of religious art, the pottery and painting, the textile work, and the small publishing houses that produce special editions of religious iconography and spiritual development treatises all speak of a depth and sight of soul beyond anything alone. One of the most surprising parts of monastic life in the modern world may well be its dedication to the arts, to the expression of passion and soul in a lifestyle that is too often assumed to be dour and lifeless. Why would monasteries make room for the arts in what is seen by too many as a life of sacrifice? Why would anybody consider the arts a necessary stream of human pursuit rather than simply a peon to culture or a glimpse of lives unseen? Why? Because the relationship between monastic life and art is palpable. Since the time of the Greek philosophers and their concentration on the good life, beauty has been counted among the ultimate values of the good life, equal even to values such as goodness and truth, as in the Greek commitment to the good, the true, and the beautiful. In fact, the idea that the ascent of the mind to God is due to the beauty encountered in the physical world is a totally ancient one. And its corollary is so simple, it's profound. Its corollary says beauty itself is the key to the fullness of the spiritual life. God is beauty, the theologians taught. And the universe is simply the irradiation of God's beauty. So if you're a monastic and you're looking for God in the first place, this is the place to go where the beautiful draws out of us the best of us. Because the beautiful is God the creator to begin with. Augustine was very clear about it. He said, it is desire for the beautiful that draws us to God. But if that's the case, the implications for the spiritual life stuns. It's, it's implying that to develop to our fullest, we must surround ourselves with beauty, not its cost, not its rarity, not the wealth it could bring, but beauty for its own sake. Beauty, the kind of beauty that burrows its way into our soul in such quantity and such quality that the years go be before we begin to understand our in that in ourselves we have grown a new way of looking at the world. As a result, monasticism cultivated the arts, and the arts expanded the spirit of monasticism and created another level of union with God. Artists, most of whom were part a workshop team that decorated cathedrals everywhere in Europe 
were the artists themselves were unnamed and unknown. It wasn't about elitism. It was about giving your life. It was about the purpose of your life. In the monasteries, artistry had a place, a voice, and most of all, a necessary role in religious life. For Angelico, a monk, Gisalbertus, uh, the layman who was trained by a monk master at the Abbey of Cluny in the 12th century, and the French abbot of Suget were all instrumental, and dozens like them, in developing new art styles, new architectural expressions, and monastics everywhere illuminated hand-printed Bibles and painted vestments and spun tapestries and silk that became the artwork of the monasteries themselves. Secular artists followed monastic communities from one region to another or simply settled down there for the rest of their life to become part of the monastic movement that spurred the building of all the great cathedrals all over Europe. Rather than suppress art as rigid religious traditions, I'm embarrassed and sorry to say, did in the name of spiritual detachment from sensuality and became a, a general theology in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, the larger theology of monasticism saw great art as an aspect of spiritual development. They learned too that they had a moral obligation to see that their art was affordable as a kind of gift to those who could not pay the going price for it, but whose spirit sought it and needed it too. The reasoning is very clear, very pungent, and very impacting. The two are one. Both artists and monastics devote themselves to seeking God, to seeing the divine, the truth, the just right. Since art reflects the beauty of creativity, art makes the beauty of God the creator present. Then beauty becomes a tool of spiritual development, a necessary part of our ascent to God, another kind of incarnation some of the philosophers said, another kind of revelation of God among us. Visual expression, great chant, polyphony, architecture, glasswork, and writing and reflection were all meant to raise the soul to mystical height. The intensely bright glass, for instance, in the soaring windows above the nave brought God's brightness into our darkness. The massive stonework, the thundering choral music, the haunting chants, the heaven-bent spires, the statues pointing to eternal holiness, lifted the mystical soul up to heaven and wrenched souls up out of the dregs of life to the anterooms of heaven. And without it, they knew the soul dries up, the world goes dark. Then plastics and faux leather and pressed wood and the whole gamut of bogus, fabricated, counterfeit attempts to pretend that the unreal is real turn the world upside down. The ability to reproduce becomes more important than the creativity of an original form or a unique rendition of an idea. Reproduction becomes more important than originality and our lives take on more of the unreal and the real, and the assembly line enhances it. It is the artist who exists to bring the soul to see beyond the visible, to the beckon of the invisible. It is art that is the lifeline of contemplation. In our own time, in a world of assembly lines and paint-by-number kits, Beauty stopped being central to a technological world. Function became the driving engine of society and the world settled down to the repetition of sameness and the reduction of the original to the level of the hackneyed and threadbare. The statues of David in plastic 
and the plethora of great historical pieces in silk carvings that became eventually the consignment of people to high rise apartment buildings, one after the other of them the same, without a single curve or turn or curly cue or beauty that kept the imagination alive and instead hastened the death of the imagination in an entire culture. It's then that we start to die inside ourselves and never even know. We cease to understand our nature as spiritual beings because there's nothing in the environment to challenge our assumptions or to uplift our hearts and minds, nothing to stir our soul to life again, newly again. It's beauty, in other words, that enables us to rise above the sordid in life and so to transform it from the inside out, to give it meaning, to give it feeling, to give it new insight, to give it vision of a better world. To this day, monasticism reminds us that art stretches us beyond the sleazy, the superficial, the fake, the false, and the gaudy. Beauty is not prettiness. Beauty transports us to another level of insight and understanding and feeling. Beauty refuses to be dull. It gives life to the lifeless, the hopeless, and changes the spiritual life from an experience of rules to an expression of awe. It is the monastic heart in us, therefore, which committed to seek God must cultivate the artistic spirit, nurture it, be keepers of it, and recreate imagination. In Tokyo, the center of Zen Buddhism and the monasticism it also brings as well, the otherworldliness of the world fairly shimmers in front of us, not gaudy or glorious, on the contrary, it is silent and sacred. In Tokyo, the side streets are, are barely more than cemented single lane footpaths. Not a slice of sky separates one building from another. And the very concentration of people and buildings crowd the spirit. But inside the new and towering skyscrapers, it is different. Tiny Japanese gardens, fountains flowing, draw visitors into intricate patterns of rock gardens and fish-filled canals that wind their way past miniature temples to huge glass doors in the building. The gardens touch up against the windows of sterile offices, stilling all the noise outside, providing privacy and contemplation for the crush of humanity that pours through the commercial center of this city. What our great office entries do not have that the Japanese provide for us assiduously is emptiness. For instance, the meeting place for our session in Tokyo, they told me, was through the double doors to the left of the elevator. No, I was not surprised to find the elevator padded with brass studded leather. The fact that the carpet in the corridor was thick and soft seemed usual enough for such a place. The real surprise, however, was the fact that beyond the huge, high, heavy oak doors, the meeting room was not the average conference room of large round tables and fold up metal chairs flung from one end of the room to the other. Instead, instead, there was nothing. There was nothing in this maroon and gold draped room, but one needle nosed red celadon vase that held one fresh yellow rose. One rose in one vase on a glass table that seemed suspended over time in the middle of a room draped 
in red and gold velvet. There was nothing, nothing but pure mindfulness, pure reverence, pure concentration, pure life. This room you had to think had been built for this one vase and this single golden rose. The stark attention, the sentinel awareness, the utterly concentrated focus on one rose steep the room in the consciousness of beauty. Focusing on one thing in nature every day I realized, one rose in a beautiful vase, one old tree, no, yes, but indomitable, one rugged mountain range undiminished by time, is meditation enough precious to make life precious, whatever it stresses. It is steeping ourselves in beauty, reaching into beauty, raising our children to understand beauty, to discover the infinite and the finite that alone may save the world, provided that we sink into its call to become more of beauty and less of rote and stereotype, to stretch our souls to the ultimate as you all have done today, taking the time to come here and to steep yourselves in this useless topic. And so you see, failing to notice one rose, or in our case, with Brother Thomas, in our hearts, in my heart, one large heavy clay vase so light, so sparkling, that it raises our eyes, our soul, to the presence of the perfect in our imperfect lives. Because otherwise, our brother Thomas taught us to, we will fail to notice the entire cosmos. Art cleanses our senses of mundane. It awakens us to see more than things and beyond things, to new insights about life, about transcendence, about new hope. And so it is up to us then to make art a sacrament of modern life. We must make our souls seekers of the earth. We must make our environments holy sites that reject the tawdry, the artificial, and the vulgar. Since art reflects the beauty of creativity, art makes the beauty of God, the creator, present. For beauty is a tool of spiritual development, a necessary part of our ascent to God the beautiful, another incarnation, another revelation of God among us. Francis Bacon reminds us over and over that beauty itself is but the sensible image of the infinite. Finally, the old monastic reminds us and the thieves of our lives that nothing else we have is worth the beauty of beauty. But most of all, you understand now how important it is that whenever you have only two pennies left in the world, you must buy a loaf of bread with one of them and a lily with the other. The bread will sustain your life, but the, but the flower will give you a reason to live. For as you have heard all your life, Jesus tells you clearly now in Matthew 4, we are not meant to live on bread alone. Thank you for coming. Joan, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, so much. When we thought of this idea of having conversations about art and spirituality, we never anticipated, or we should have anticipated how spectacular it would be hearing you and being inspired by you. I'm reminded of a couple of things uh, as we soon will come to a close, but one of them is the Thomas's first book that we published was called The Path to the Beautiful. And the normal presumption of beauty is a superficial notion. 
And what you have allowed us to do is to understand the beauty of who we can be. And all we need to do is awaken that in ourselves. Thomas reminded us of it over and over again. In the most recent book of quotes that we published, there is in it an echo of what you just said. Consciousness of the beautiful will save the world. And I just think it's so amazing that all these years later, the two of you are still talking to one another. And that's a big achievement. And the last thing I would share before we have a word from Sister Stephanie is this wonderful quote of Thomas that's in the documentary that was done in 1991. The thing we all strive for is to shape our humanity in the image of God, to do good, to stand up for what is true, create what is beautiful, and live for what unites and does not divide. What an opportunity, what a challenge, what a blessing you have been, the community has been, and Thomas was to all of us. Can we hear Stephanie, please? Thank you, John, for that very inspiring reflection on the power of beauty and how it needs to be an essential part of our lives. In these difficult days of the pandemic with its isolation, darkness and confusion, it is refreshing for us to focus on all that is true and good and beautiful, like a breath of spring in the midst of this snowy winter. Thank you, Joan, for reminding us that beauty is the key to the spiritual life and through art, the beauty of God, our creator, is revealed. You have reawakened our appreciation of beauty as a way to see the face of God and as a beacon calling us home to be our best selves. Thank you for the richness of this presentation, full of treasures to explore for many days to come. Brother Thomas once wrote, there are two signs of a great soul, generosity and gratitude. And on behalf of the Benedictine Sisters of Erie, I want to express our gratitude to Bernie and Sue Pucker and the Pucker Gallery for making this event possible today. This touch of beauty has lifted our souls. And if you've never been to the gallery in Boston, you can visit virtually at puckergallery.com and view Brother Thomas's pottery. Or the next time you're in Erie, visit our small gallery of Thomas's work right here at the monastery. Through the Pucker's generosity, we will be able to host annual presentations on art and spirituality for the next four years. Hopefully, next year we will have this event on site at our monastery in Erie. And live stream it for those of you who live around the world. So please watch our website for further details. Once again, thank you, Joan, for your inspiration. Thank you, Bernie and Sue, for your very generous gift. And thanks to all of you who joined us today for this presentation. Let us go forth convinced that beauty will save the world.